Yeah, well, so actually, um, you wouldn't think it because Pittsburgh is not a huge city, uh, but we're right on par uh, with the national average. We get between 40 and 45 percent of our clients are GLBT. Um, one of the things that people get hooked up on uh, when they're talking about, well, how many queer, how many queer youth do you serve? Um, not everybody identifies as queer. It's their behavior. Um, you know, we talk, we talk to them about who their sexual partners are, or who they hang out with, or um, so on and so forth, and they'll tell you after the seventh or tenth time you've met with them that, yeah, you know, I, I'm kind of DL, or which is down low, or, you know, yeah, I, I like both, but it's not safe where some of these kids live to be out and to be okay with being gay, and that's not, that's not including cultural issues, not only the homeless community, but if we're getting into uh, minority communities, the, the, the cultural issues are so huge um, that some of them will just say whatever they need to say to get access to services, to not feel judged. Um, you know, here anybody can come in. Um, this has worked to our advantage and disadvantages at times because our name is the Gay and Lesbian Community Center. So when they walk in here, uh, you know, they automatically have to be okay with that. Uh, some of them, uh, which is beyond me, they just miss that. And so we'll start talking about programs and things. And they'll be like, oh, gay people, yes. Yes, this is a safe space for you too. And then they're like, oh yeah, well I kind of go that way too. That's fine, we don't care. You know, um, but that's often not something that's discussed sometimes for months. You know, this isn't, you know, and some of our young adults, they come in and you can, you know, they're out and proud and they're good, but most often those folks are couch surfing. They're not necessarily street homeless. Um, homeless, different variation. Uh, and so therefore, I feel that they might be in a safer environment because they're living with other queer friends or they're buddied up with their best friend or, or whatever. They're not live, like literally living under a bridge. We're at the whim of whoever else is out there. Um, and you don't want to be, you don't, I hate to use this language, but it's something that one of them has said to me is you don't want to be seen as weird or different when you have to fit in and try to stay warm and get fed every day. You know, and then there's the issue of, I think it's great, all of the services that happen in the community. I've heard time and time again from the youth that come here that some of the places they go to get fed, they have to uh, listen to a sermon before they do that. Now, that's all fine and good. That's their prerogative. But these kids, you know, like, they <clears throat> already feel bad because some of them are not employed. Some of them are. Um, but some of them are not employed, they can't get their feet under them, they don't have a physical place to stay, and then in order to even get a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, they have to listen to somebody lecture them, you know, which is how it comes off to them, that's what they say. Um, but this is, a, this is a widespread problem, and it's, you know, we decided when we started to say yes that while my program, because I am the director here at the Gay and Lesbian Community Center, but I also work, um, then that's a volunteer position, um, but I work for PERSAD, and that's how I got into the homeless outreach, um, because that was a program, that's a program that started um, through PERSAD, the Street Outreach Services Program. Um, and then, you know, in order to do that work, I had to make these connections with these community members, and that's how all this started. Um, you know, what has been beneficial is that I have been able to personally make connections and my previous staff uh, had been able to make personal connections with folks to talk about queer homelessness, to talk about the fact that if somebody comes up to you to talk about something personal, and if you're not comfortable, you can call here. You can call any of us, um, or just me, and, uh, you know, ask a question, send them over, you know, or, you know, if you, if you want to continue to be their main contact and you don't know what they're saying, uh, which is often a problem with young people, call because most likely somebody here knows. Um, or if you don't know where to refer them, we get a lot of calls from uh, people's therapists or caseworkers who are like, you know, this kid just came out as trans and I have no connection. What can we do? Well, we got you because we have a resource manual and people here that provide therapy services and resources personally through Perset or wherever 
to get them connected, to get them to the next best step. And that really is the focus of this program. You know, we, I, tell, I tell all of the young adults that we work with that our, our focus is not to, you know, get you rich or, you know, make, make or what the language, they, make it rain. Um, but it is to get you to, you know, do you, have you eaten today? Would you, here you go, this is what we have. We'd actually worked out through our connections, having food here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Wednesday is provided by Persad, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday is provided by either community members or like for instance, Lydia's Coffee. Every Thursday donates her leftover curry pasta, which the kids love, you know, and eat it up. Um, you know, and so there's a, there's a small meal here. Meal here. Uh, if they haven't showered, we connect them to Project Silk because they have a shower. They're open five days a week. You know, um, we help them get medical services if they need hygiene products. Um, you know, we have one client. We have a couple clients actually, but uh, our one client is very active and here often, who has a baby. And so sometimes she'll need stuff for the kid, and that's fine because we've had people donate it, and we're happy to give it. Um, but she never has to feel shy about asking or feel ashamed about asking or saying, I need this. She can have it. You know, I try, the, the biggest challenge is for the folks that first come in um, because you have to break down that wall. Um, and you have to do it in a meaningful and purposeful way and not like a bull in a china shop. Uh, because you don't know what these kids have been through, you know, and queer or straight, they've all had a hard road to toe, right, you know. Um, some of these kids have been sexually abused. Some of these kids have just been plain out rejected, and it's not just, re and especially our queer youth, it's not just rejected one time. It's rejected at school, it's rejected at home, it's rejected from, from extended family, and going from feeling connected and like you have support to absolutely nothing.